praise the Lord. We're so glad that you joined us tonight. This is Pastor Randy Richardson with the Bible Heritage Pentecostal Holiness Church in Waycross, Georgia. We're going to start off with a song that says, I thank you, thank you, Jesus. I thank you for all the days of my life. God has been good to us, and so we want to praise him tonight. So let's just uh, sing together. I thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all the days of my life. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. I thank you for all the days of my life. I was sick, Lord, you healed me. I was sick. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. One of my favorite songs in the whole world is, Won't it be wonderful there, having no burdens to bear?
changing hand. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let me just make sure I can see the service going on so if it stops for some reason we'll be able to not just keep preaching to the empty house but preach to you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. One second here. And we'll have this correct. Here we go. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse number 8, we're going to look at verses 8 through 12, 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 12, I want to, I've entitled this message, Christians are different, Christians are different, the Bible calls us peculiar people, and as peculiar people, we're different. And if you're not different from the world, then you're probably not born again. Because when you get truly born again, you want to be different than the world. You want to serve God. You want to make God happy. You want to do the things that please God. You want to live according to the book and uh, just serve God with everything that you have. Let's read verse 8. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. I want to just say this before we get into the meat of the word. One of the greatest ways that you can study the Bible is the way that we are studying it on Wednesday nights. We're taking the verses verse by verse so you can't take the scriptures out of context. When you read a whole chapter or a whole book, you're getting the, the big picture. And we've got to compare scripture with scripture. If something doesn't add up in just one little verse, you need to look at the rest of the total Bible to see what the gist of the Bible talks about and and uh, where people get into strange and false teaching is when they pull a scripture here and pull a scripture there and make them uh, uh, tag team up to complement their doctrine. But you need to read the Word of God at face value and let the Word of God speak for itself. And when we study the Word of God and we stay within the context of how it was written, then we shouldn't get off in our theology and, and uh, you know, when there's a troubling verse, read about three or four commentaries on it. Uh, see what other people say. 
about that particular verse. Ask the Holy Spirit to make it real to your heart. And if somebody's teaching you something and the Spirit of God gives you that alarm going off, then you listen to the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. And um, I, I was listening to a man on Facebook. Somebody sent me a link to a man in a pulpit and he was sharing some things and and I thought to myself, I need to check that out. What he's saying sounds great. I hope it's true. But when I got into the Word of God and I took the verse and I went to my concordance and pulled up the, the Strong's concordance and I pulled up the definition of that word that he was saying, it didn't say what he was trying to make it say. And, and so, you know, don't just take somebody's word for things. You get in that book yourself. You get in this book and you study for yourself and you know whether somebody is giving you the truth or not. Sister Mamie Williams, my, one of my mothers in the Lord, used to say, uh, rat poison is 98% cornmeal and you can make some mighty good corn muffins and cornbread out of it. But it's the 2% poison that kills the rat. And that's exactly what will happen in your spiritual life. If you pull a scripture here and you pull a scripture there and you don't know that it lines up with the, with the way it's supposed to be. So make sure that you're studying and breaking down the passages verse by verse and word by word. Peter is writing this letter. It's a letter just like if you were overseas and you wrote a letter to your honey. If you wrote that letter... That's what Peter's doing to the church at large. He's writing a letter that goes out to these believers that are being persecuted so drastically. And, and, and they're hunted down. They're being, uh, they possibly lost a wife or a husband or a parent or a child because they've been found out that they were believers. And then they were killed because of the cause of Christ. They're living under enormous pressure and so I, I, I can't even imagine that. But even still, when you're living amongst heathens, when you're living in a sinful world, when you're living in, in, in an atmosphere where your family's against you, your neighbors are against you, all your co-workers are against you, and it just seems like you're an island to yourself, and you feel like that sixth finger or that eleventh toe uh, well, you got to have five, so it'd be six toe and, and 11 uh, if you had six. Well, if you had six on each side, it'd be 12. So math lesson, praise the Lord. But in all of that, Peter instructs the believers that are going through tough times that they still have to act like Christ. They still have to be different than the world. Just because people treat you wrong doesn't give you the right to treat them wrong back. Just because you don't agree with this one or that one, you still have to treat them with kindness. And so here's the instruction that he gives to these poor persecuted believers who want to have retaliation, who want to have vengeance, who want to have bitterness and strife and anger and frustration. They want to have all these hard feelings. But Peter says, uh-uh-uh-uh, you can't allow yourself to go there. You've got to stop yourself and remind yourself that you are a believer and believers are peculiar people. We are different than the world. So let's see what he says that we need to do that's so different. Number one, he says, be of one mind. Be of one mind. If there's one thing that churches cannot seem to get, it's being in the same mind. There's Baptists and Methodists and Nazarenes and Pentecostals and, 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 and Jehovah Witnesses and, and Mormons and Catholics and, and Episcopalians and Presbyterians and uh, you name it. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of different theories out there on, on who's right. Well, one of the greatest tactics of the enemy is that he can get the body of Christ divided, then we will, we will forget the true purpose of the church, and that's to uh, equip people for the work of the ministry. It's all about the work of the ministry, of building the kingdom of God. 
And if we can get our minds on the color of toilet paper in the women's restroom, or we can get our minds on who sang the, the special in the choir, or, or who didn't get called into the nursery, or, or if we can get our minds on, on the, the, the carpet is the wrong color, or the walls are painted the wrong color, or, or, or I just don't like the suit or the lack of a suit that the preacher's wearing, if we get our minds on, on negativity, we're going to find ourselves unusable in the plan of God. Did you know that sometimes God wants to use you to minister to that person that persecuted you, that did you wrong, that caused so much pain in your life? God wants to use you. And so if the enemy can get my mind to being in disagreement, and if you study the totality of the Word of God, just look at the first couple of chapters of 1 Corinthians where he says, some say I'm of Paul and some say I'm of, uh, of Apollos and some say I'm of, of Peter and some say I, I'm only of Jesus. And, and, and there was division there. And we know that in Philippians 4.2, Paul had to address two ladies in the church, Euodius and Syntyche, and he had to say to them, be of the same mind in the Lord. That was Philippians 4, uh, verse 2. The girls, uh, Braylon and Brianna, our, our two adopted daughters, our granddaughters, but they're our daughters now. And Braylon and Brianna were in the womb together in my daughter's womb uh, for nine months. They shared uh, a crib. They shared beds. They've shared rooms for 11 years now. And I thought if this coronavirus didn't get over with, I was going to have to drown both of them in the bathtub because they got sick of each other. They got to where they were just yap, 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 yapping to each other and, and, and just getting on my last nerve. I was so thankful coronavirus or no coronavirus, they were going to school so they could get away from us just for a little while. Praise the Lord. But did you know that if you're around people long enough, you're going to disagree with them on something? And so we have to purpose in our mind that we know, we know that we're going to have disagreements. And that's why the Bible teaches us to prefer our brother over us. That means I need to bend my will and allow somebody else to get their way instead of me getting my way. And so Paul say or Peter saying, be of one mind. When, when, when you're under oppression, when you're being beaten down, hunted down, just like these believers were. You all need to be in one accord because if you can get one accord, you can have an Acts 2 experience where the Holy Ghost falls in the midst of wherever you're at. If you can have a one accord and one mind moment, you'll be able to pray for the sick and see them recover. You'll be able to cast out devils in the name of Jesus. But if you're divided in your home with your children, with your husband, your wife, in your church, in your office, where you work, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, whatever club you might be a part of, if, you're, if you get divided, you will never achieve anything. And it's especially true in the work of God. Well, the second thing he says there is having compassion for one another. Did you know that a lot of people don't know how to have compassion? There's two words that we need to learn and really get down as a believer. And that word is empathy and sympathy. When I am showing sympathy to someone, I'm sorry for what they've gone through. I, I had several people I've been working with the census uh, uh, group for about a week and a half now and I've gone to home after home after home and I get there and, and, and we're going through the people that were in the home and they said well my mom was living with us but she died and the first thing that I say is I'm sorry for your loss I'm sorry for what you had to go through there and you know what I've never had anybody say don't say that to me 
every single person that I've ever showed sympathy said, thank you, thank you. God's people need to show sympathy to people that are going through stuff, especially those that are under pressure, those that are in depression, those that are struggling in their emotions, those that are going through difficult times with their children and grandchildren, those that are struggling on their jobs, that don't know whether they're going to be able to keep their jobs, the pressure, the pressure, the pressure. Have compassion. Show sympathy. Well, the other word is empathy. That means I'm feeling it with them. I'm going through it with them. They're hurting, so I'm hurting with them. I have an ability to understand and share their feelings because God will give you that ability if you'll pray and ask him for it. It's not too hard to say, I'm sorry. I can't imagine what you're going through. I can't imagine what you're feeling. Is there anything I can do for you? Those are words that God's people need to have in their mouth on a regular basis. When people are going through stuff, you as a believer need to listen to them and hear them out, even if they say it 10 times, even if they repeat it over and over and over and you've heard it and you could repeat it back to them. You listen to them. You listen to them. Connect with their feelings and acknowledge their pain. Show them the love of Jesus Christ in a real tangible way. One of the best ways to show compassion for one another is to put on the love of the Lord Jesus Christ every day. Everywhere you go, every person you see, you need to be showing the love of Jesus Christ. The third thing he says is we need to love as brothers. When Alicia and I got married, I had three children and she had two, two boys and I had two girls and a boy. And uh, from the moment that uh, we prayed at, at my house and God showed us that Alicia was supposed to be my wife, we, uh, the kids immediately took Brent and Darren as their brothers. And uh, they, they were, there was no greater bond than the boys had uh, with each other. And Alicia and I would try to pump one boy to fess up on the others and they wouldn't do it. Their lips were sealed. They were, they were uh, sealed-lipped uh, brothers. And God wants us to have that same kind of love as brothers that we keep whatever they tell us in confidence, confident. We don't need to be blabbing to our other brothers and sisters in the form of a prayer request. We don't need to be telling other people, other folks' is business. We need to make sure that we are keeping our mouths closed and not telling other people's problems. That will get a person hurt quicker than anything in the world. Fourth thing he says is be tender-hearted. Tender-hearted. It's the same word used in Ephesians 4.32 where Paul says, Be kind one to another, tender-hearted forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Webster defines this word, tenderhearted, as easily moved to love, pity, sorrow, and compassion. We need to make sure that we're tenderhearted. Life can make you hard. You can become bitter. You can become hard because life dealt you a rough hand. I remember as a kid growing up, uh, I was um, growing up really hard. And we really weren't allowed to show our emotions in our home. We were basically encouraged to keep it to ourselves and not to cry. Real men don't cry. But um, I remember when I was 17, I got burned really bad. A stove blew up in our in our kitchen and, and I was consumed the whole room was consumed with fire and, and uh, as I got outside my skin was beginning to drip like wax it was so painful I can still remember today and 
And I remember getting in the car and, and my mother, my brother was driving, my mother was in the car, daddy was still putting the fire out in the, in the kitchen and we're heading to the hospital and I look over my mother and I said, mama, I'm hurting so bad, can I cry? And I thought about that years later. Why did I have to ask my mother if I could cry? Why did I have to? It's because I just didn't feel comfortable in our home to show my emotions and cry. But when I left home and I got into a different environment and I got into Bible college and the environment there was, was one of peace and love and joy and contentment, the Holy Ghost and and I remember it just going into the chapel service and saying, Lord, I want more of you and less of me. I want more of you and less of me. And Lord, break me. Break me. Don't let me be this hard person that I've become. But Lord, melt me. We sang Sunday that chorus, Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. We need to say, Lord, mold me and make me. Take this old stony heart out of me and let me have compassion for others. And you know what? I can't even watch an episode of the Waltons or Little House on the Prairie or any of these shows without tears coming into my eyes now because God answered my prayer and he gave me a heart of compassion and love and mercy and I'm so thankful for it. Peter goes on to say the next thing that makes us different is he wants us to be courteous. To be courteous, that means to be friendly and kind. Do you still open the door for other people? Do you let other people go ahead of you? I was going to a, a doctor's office the other day, and this lady got into a foot race with me. Now, I wasn't racing with her, but, buddy, she wanted to get in that door before I did, and she was just a booking it. I mean, she was an elderly lady, and she was just really wanting to make sure she got there before I did. I've gone to the store and had... People just take their buggies and wheel ahead of me, knowing I was fixing to turn in there. But they, they wheeled their buggy to get ahead of me. And seeing I only had maybe four or five items, and they had a, enough to put in two buggies, but they, they piled it way high. And, and I thought to myself, now I couldn't do that to somebody. You've got to be courteous. As a believer, we don't need to get ourselves ahead of other people, but we need to let other people have the preeminence. I had a neighbor in Keystone Heights when I lived down there, and uh, twice a year he had a party, a drunken party actually, and he'd come over, he was the principal of the high school, and he'd come over to my house and he'd knock on my door, and he'd say, Randy, he said, now, Twice a year, I have a party, and it gets kind of wild, and it goes till 2 in the morning. And I'm, he said, it's always on Saturday night, and I know you're a pastor, and I know you got to preach on Sunday. He said, but it's just twice a year. He said, can you avoid calling the police? I said, oh, I called his name, and I said, look, man. I said, um, <laughs> you do whatever you, you do, and I love you no matter what, and, and, and I'm not going to call the police. You know, some people, they just sit on the phone to call the police because some kid rode a bike down their road or somebody's walking down the road that don't necessarily belong there. And, you know, they, they bother the police about every little thing. And, 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 and I just believe that we need to be courteous people, people that the world loves to be around, not the old nasty lady at the corner, not the old grumpy man that lives across the street. We need to be God's people that are friendly and courteous. You'll never win anybody to the Lord by jumping ahead of them in line. <laughs> you know, it might be that the next Sunday that they're sitting behind you in church and then they're looking at you saying, you know what, that's that old man that jumped ahead of me in line. That's that old woman that jumped ahead of me that, that, that tried to race me to the door. Be courteous as a child of God. That makes us different. 
What about people that are mean to you? Should you be courteous to people that are mean to you? What did Jesus say? Luke 6, 31, as just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. And so we don't return. That was the next thing Peter said. Don't return evil for evil or reviling for reviling. I want you to hear the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 38 through 47. Hear what Jesus said to you and I. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it has been said, you shall love your neighbor, neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Man, that's a tall order. That is difficult to do, but that's what makes us different. That's why we're a peculiar people. Because we have to treat people that treat us bad, we have to treat them good. Peter continues, blessing, knowing that you're called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. You want to be blessed? You want to live a blessed lifestyle? Then you get in the habit of blessing other people. Do, do you chew people out? Do you get angry easily? You get offended easily. If you do, you need to find an altar by your couch or by your chair or by your bed or come to this church and we've got plenty of altar space and you get before God and you pray it out of yourself because that is, uh, that's not godly. You're called to this, to be a blesser. You're called to be a blesser. When people see you coming, they shouldn't run from you. They ought to be running up to you because they want a blessing from you. You encourage folks. You uplift folks. You strengthen folks. You offer to help people. If you do, then you'll inherit a blessing, Peter said. And I want to be blessed, so I'm going to be a blesser. Then he says to refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. deceit. When you're being persecuted, one of the greatest temptations is to talk trash about the people that are persecuting you. I'm here to tell you God's not pleased with that. He wants us to pray through until all that comes out of us. He wants us to pray through until every root of bitterness is gone from our lives. That in the uh, that soul and soul cheated me. That blankety blank person lied to me. That company did me wrong. That temptation to retaliate brings a heart of revenge. And you know, I've heard so many people quote that Old Testament scripture that talks about an eye for an eye. Yes, the book of Exodus 21 and Leviticus 24 uh, brings up the... Uh, the the discussion of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But let me say this. Those scriptures were only meant for the judicial uh, element of God's people, the judges. It was not meant for the common man to go knock out somebody's tooth that knocked your tooth out. It was never implied to be an actual tooth for a tooth or an eye for an eye but to wait for the judge to weigh out that the judgment fit the crime, that the sentence fit the penalty of the crime. So if I lost a tooth, I don't know that that's worth millions of dollars, but it might be worth, you know, $10,000. It might be worth you know, what it would cost to have a, one of those implants put in there, you know, 
So they need to weigh it out, and, and that's what they need to do. Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Did you hear what I said? Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it's, for it's written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. People would do my mother wrong. And my mother, uh, people would say, why don't you do this to them? Or why don't you do that to them? Or why don't you do this? And my mother would say, well, you know, God's watching. God saw what they did to me. And she said, my Bible says vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. And she said, he can repay so much better than anything I could think of. So I'm just going to leave it to God, and I'm going to let him do his job. Let's go on. Peter goes on to write to those poor persecuted people. He said, let him turn away from evil and do good. Turn away from evil. That means you don't embrace those feelings. You don't embrace those hard feelings, that hatred, that bitterness. You don't embrace strife or vengeance. You do good even in the face of persecution and adversity. Then he goes on to say, let him seek peace and pursue it. Always look for the peaceful solution. Always look for the right way out, God's way. Life's too short. Find the higher ground. Seek truth and justice when you need to. But overall, seek peace. And pursue it. I had a man. He rented my home that I owned in Lakeland when I left Bible college. I had bought a house and got called to go to Yulee. And for two years, I tried to rent that house out, and it just just seemed like that people don't like to pay rent. And uh, I had a realtor scream the people to their backgrounds, and even with that, I still lost my shirt on that house. And uh, finally, I gave it back to the bank, and I'd made so many improvements that they didn't even charge my credit for it because I'd made so many improvements. They were able to sell it to uh, uh, for a lot more money than I owed them for it. But this man, I, I, I got a little in the flesh, and, and I went down to court, and I had that man drug into court, and he owed me 900 and something dollars. And uh, the judge said to me, uh, or he said to the man, do you have any cash? And the man said, no, I lost my job. That's why I didn't pay. And he said, you know you could have called this man and told him why. Because the man never called me. He never answered my calls. He never answered the door when I go down to the house. And, you know, he just, he just didn't do it the right way. And so he owed me 900 and something dollars. And the judge said, well, sir, do you own a car? And he said, yes, sir, I, I own a car. He said, is it paid off? He said, yes, it is. And he looked over at me and he said, I can order that the man give you the title to that car and it'll be yours. And I looked at the judge and I said, no, your honor, I, I cannot take the man's only way to work just to pay me back $900. I said, just have him give me a payment plan of $50 a month until he pays it back to me. Now, I'm here to tell you, people would say, Randy, you're a fool because you should have took that car, sold it, and then you'd have had your $900 back. But you know what? I, I, I felt in my heart I shouldn't do that. I kept feeling the witness of the Spirit say, no, 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 no. I really probably shouldn't even have took him to court. But the truth of it was, I could have taken him to court and not been long. Because he justly owed me that money. But I had to weigh it out and say, I, I can't take the man's only way to get to work or he won't be able to make any money to feed his family. And so, just as a side note, he never paid me the $50 a month. <laughs> he stiffed me and still owes me the $900. But you know what? I wrote it off a long time ago because that's what God's people do. We forgive. We forgive. We forgive. He goes on to say, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. 
God sees what you're going through. The eyes of the Lord are watching you. And when you're being persecuted and you're being hunted down and you're being talked about and laughed at and, and, and folks are doing things against you, God sees it and God will take care of it. And he'll hear your cry of pain and suffering. He'll hear you when you're going through horrible struggles. Last night, my hand was hurting me so bad I couldn't hardly even go to sleep. And, 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 I, and I just prayed. I said, Father, I need you to touch this hand. I, I would love it if you just touch it forever, but if you just touch it tonight, I need to go to sleep. And you know what? The Lord just let me drift right off, and the hand just eased up. And I'm so blessed that God heard my cry. Hallelujah. And then he said, the last thing here, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. If there's one person I don't want against me, that's God. I don't want the Lord against me. <laughs> my mother used to use a crepe myrtle switch, and she'd say, boy, go out there in the back where we had about eight crepe myrtle switches, trees, and she'd say, pick one off about the size of my pinky. And I'd go out there and I'd just be sweating bullets, you know, because I knew what was coming. That switch was going to come across, uh, across my legs and it was going to hurt. There was going to be blood because that's the way mama did it. And, and I dreaded it. Man, when I handed her that switch and she started, I did me a little Indian dance and I I'd scream and holler and I'd run under the, hide under the bed. I'd jump in the closet. I'd do whatever I could do to get away from that punishment that Mama was in, uh, you know, imparting. But I'd hate to know that God was coming after me with his discipline because that's worse than any old switch you'll ever get. Several years ago, I had a lady in one of the churches we pastored, and she was one of these puffed up, super spiritual people. And uh, she just, uh, she'd go around to this lady and this one lady, she struggled with diabetes and she'd tell her, you don't have any faith because you have diabetes. And she'd go to this other woman, she'd say, you don't have any faith because you have high blood pressure. And she would just condemn all the people in the church. And her last, her maiden name was Wigglesworth. And she claimed, I don't believe her, but she claimed that she was related to Smith Wigglesworth. And it wouldn't matter if she was related to Jesus Christ himself. She acted horrible. <laughs> and, and, and you don't go around puffed up and acting superior. Well, let me tell you what my Bible says about that woman. It says, judge not, lest you be judged. For in the same manner in which you judge, you shall be judged. That's what the Bible says. And I, about 10, 12 years later... I ran into that lady. She was at another church, and I was in that meeting, and, and I saw her there, and I walked over and greeted her, and she said to me, Oh, Brother Richardson, please pray for me. I've got diabetes, and I've got high blood pressure. And the first thing that came to my mind was, I can remember you tormenting poor old sister so-and-so because she had diabetes and you ridiculed sister so-and-so this other little lady because she had high blood pressure and now you got them both because you judged and in the same manner you judged you are now judged and I just looked at her and I said sister I'll be praying for you I'll be praying for you because I you know when God judges somebody I don't know that I can pray it off of them I, I don't know we're living in difficult times today, saints, and a lot of God's people are hated. We're seeing uh, unprecedented hatred in this time that we're living. I saw a, a, a post on Twitter from a pastor, from a pastor who tweeted when Donald Trump, our president's brother, died here this past week. He tweeted out, Hashtag wrong Trump. In other words, he wished Donald Trump had died instead of Donald Trump's brother. And I was horrified when I saw this supposed man of God. And I quickly wrote him a note 
And I said, my brother, I beg of you to repent. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I beg of you to repent of this hatred you have for our president. You might not agree with our president. You might not agree with the last five or six presidents or the next five or six presidents. But you never have the right to hate them. And you never have the right to speak evil. The Bible commands us to pray for those who are in leadership. And whether you agree with them or not, you pray for them and ask the Lord because we're different. That's what we do. And this man claiming to be a Christian, claiming to be a bishop of his church, he just sent chills up and down my spine. But we're living in that kind of society where even God's people are saying some of the most hateful, harsh, prejudiced, racial, horrible things about all sides of all races. I'm here to tell you, God's not pleased with it, and we're different. We don't do that. Tonight, I want you to pray with me that God will break you. I want him to pray that God will break me. I want to stay broken before the Lord. I want him to use me any time, any way, any place, anyhow he wants to use me. And I want you to pray that God will use you in the same manner. Let's pray. Father, we yield ourselves right now to you and we say, Father, break us. Break us, whatever it takes, Lord. Remove that stoniness. Maybe we've been hurt. Maybe we've been wounded. Maybe we grew up hard. Maybe we've had a hard life and life has dealt us a really cruel hand. But God, we give you permission to make us more like you. We want to be different like your word says. We want to do these things that Peter challenged us to do. Oh God, I pray in Jesus' name. Mold us and make us after your will. Make us more like you, Jesus. And we give you glory and praise for it all. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen, amen, amen. You keep praying that prayer, saints. You keep praying that prayer. When you find yourself, that little whatever creeping up out of you, you pound it down and cast it out in Jesus' name. Command it to go in the name of the Lord. Don't allow it to take root in you. Let no root of bitterness stay inside of you. Whatever it takes, forgive, love, show compassion, do all these things that Peter said that we should do. We love you. We'll be back in the service Sunday morning. We'll be in the house for those that are comfortable to come and join us in worship. Or you can watch us online at 11 with a Facebook Live. And then as close to 1230 as we can possibly get it uploaded, we'll have it uploaded to YouTube for those that want to watch it on their television sets. And, uh, and then anytime thereafter, if you're away for some reason Sunday morning, you can catch us on demand anytime on Facebook or on YouTube. We love you. God bless you. See you Sunday morning.